For some time, I've been contemplating the peculiar situation that existed in Egypt at the beginning of the Christian era. The city of Alexandria had become the great center of learning for the entire Western civilization. Alexandria had been founded in the time of Alexander the Great and was under the domination of the Greek pharaohs, the Ptolemies. And this domination continued until the death of Cleopatra, and then Rome took over. But the tremendous interest in Alexandria developed around the almost incomparable amassment of knowledge that was assembled there. Practically every field of human research was developed, unfolded, and progressed within the Alexandrian atmosphere. Alexandria was a city on the caravan routes. East and West mingled there. The Oriental doctrines and the Greco-Latin doctrines mingled together in a very strange confusion. After the rise of Christianity, both the Christian faith and Judaism had strong holdings in Alexandria. And it is safe to say that the composite there was made up of at least a dozen or twenty of the great religions and philosophies of antiquity. It was an amazing and uh, unique center of learning. There was one other important factor in the Alexandrian complex, and that was the great structure of libraries. The Alexandrian libraries were the most famous in antiquity and probably the largest ever assembled in ancient times. The Serapium and the Brachium contained together over a million manuscripts, tablets, and papyri containing the wisdom of the ancient world. When these libraries were ruthlessly destroyed, humanity was deprived of perhaps more knowledge than we will ever realize or, or appreciate. The destruction of these libraries also closed off our knowledge of the source of Alexandrian wisdom. It is quite possible that many ideas, beliefs, and doctrines which we now believe were invented in Alexandria were actually derived from the great research libraries and therefore had a solid substance, but the substance has vanished and only le legends and fables remain. It is interesting, for example, to realize that the first and major interpreter of the fables of Aesop lived in Alexandria. Also, we learn that from Hero, one of the custodians of knowledge in that time, that Alexandrians invented the first slot machine. They did not uh, spread out candies, bars, or cigarettes. Believe it or not, by putting a coin in a small slot, you received a sprinkle of holy water. But our modern slot machine is based upon the Alexandrian model. Everywhere we find them, in herbalism, in medicine, in philosophy, in art, literature, poetry, these mysterious people that occupied this great Egyptian area were almost universally learned. We know, for example, that the entire structure of hermetic thinking and the story of Hermes Trismegistus arose in Alexandria. And we also know that the Alexandrians must have had considerable sense of prophecy. It was there also that the Sibylline books developed that prophesied the future of the world. It was Ptolemy of Alexandria that gave the world astronomy.
and very largely contributed to the rise of astrology. There were zoological gardens, there were ponds for fish, there were reserves to protect animals. There was just about anything and everything you can think of. And not far outside of the boundaries of Alexandria stood the great group of pyramids, would have remained to this time the wonders of the world. Very little is actually known about the pyramids. Contemporary records are very scanty. They are mentioned by Herodotus in the 5th century B.C. But for the most part, no one has had a, an interest deep enough to attempt to investigate the circumstances surrounding the building of these great monuments. To this day, we really do not know why they were built, when they were built, and how it has happened uh, that they have continued to intrigue human thinking for so long a period of time. Perhaps the most simple beginning for the search for pyramids is to realize that the pyramid builders represent a period in the development of human society. Pyramids were built in many different places. Probably one of the most interesting groups right here on the Western Hemisphere, the pyramid towers and temples of the Aztec and Maya culture. A few years ago, enormous pyramids were discovered in central China. And we know that the ziggurats of Babylon and Chaldea were all part of this great pyramid building scheme of things. The shape of the pyramid changed considerably in the course of time. In the beginning, it was a mound, and the very earliest examples still had the mound form, and these are still found in the great monuments in Java, the Buru Budur, which is probably one of the most powerful and fascinating religious monuments now surviving, the Shui Degon in Rangoon, the great cities of the Khmer culture of Indochina, Cambodia, and Laos, all of these have pyramid structures peculiar to them. Pyramids appear, foreshortened or otherwise, also in graphic art, and among the mandalas of Tibet, Mongolia, Bhutan, Korea, China, and Japan, the pyramid design occurs frequently and represents a, a basis of a great meditation picture. This has led some scholars to assume that the pyramids were meditation symbols, that they were created for the purpose of reminding the individual that there was a mysterious reality underlying all the temporal and changeable patterns of mankind. In the Asclepian dialogue, Hermes, describes the fact that, in a sense, these buildings were memorials to the divine power. They bore witness to those times and those thoughts when the gods walked with men. They became part of a traditional heritage, and if we study Neoplatonism, we will come to the conclusion that the gods who walked with men were actually the gods in men that it was a divine level of insight which resulted in the great architectural feedback which we know as the pyramids. Actually, the circumstances around them challenge our imagination. We know that whoever built the great pyramid of Giza was well acquainted with astronomy, that he had a very complete knowledge of the solar system, and all of the wonders of the cosmic plan as revealed through the bodies and objects moving in the heavens. He knew the distances between the Earth and the other planets of the solar system. He knew the precession of the equinoxes. He realized the importance of the star groups. He already knew the decans and dodecanates of the, uh, of the zodiac. These things just do not fit in to the general concept that we have of the state of the world when the pyramid was presumed to have been built. 
The only possible answer is, on this level, that at the time the pyramid builders labored, they had a knowledge among themselves that had not been distributed to the people. Even the rulers did not possess this knowledge. And that there was a cult or sect of architects and artificers, uh, the builders of monuments, who knew the proportions and mathematics and had deeply in, imbibed from the wisdom of Pythagoras and Euclid. But even this isn't a complete explanation, for it is almost impossible to determine how this tremendous job was done. The idea that we have is far too trite. They thought that perhaps they were simply built as a result of slave labor in Egypt will not hold water. It is simply not sufficient the amount of work that is involved in those monuments simply transcends imagination. Also, they require a skill and a group of instrumental aids, which we do not believe that antiquity possessed. So a great many persons long ago in Alexandria, and more recently right here now, have fallen back upon this uh, supernatural hypothesis. When we can't imagine how a thing was done, we begin to believe that it must have been done by magic or some supernatural power or force. The Chinese have long believed that their great wall was built by the gods. They did not believe that any human being could build it. And it is only natural when we come into the presence of something that transcends our own abilities that we begin to wonder whether some strange esoteric means was involved as in the case of the statues on Easter Island and many other such unsolved mysteries of antiquity. To fall back upon this supernatural theory uh, is comforting to a degree, but it can lead us into serious complications, because we know that the Egyptians and other nations of that period were esotericists. We know that they had a knowledge of natural law far ahead of their time, and they had a responsibility for the use of natural law far ahead of our time. These people had a deep appreciation for the immensity and integrity of the universal plan. They had already discovered thousands of years ago that you cannot break natural law without suffering. They had never developed that strange type of egotism which impels us often to assume that God is depending upon us to take care of his purposes and plans. They did not think this. They realized or believed that they were the servants of an infinite reality. Now, in the uh, development of Neo-Alexandrian mysticism, uh, we have an interesting point that is brought out by Plotinus and Proclus, namely that mysticism, which is an internalization of faculties and which releases certain esoteric forces within the person, very often, in fact, almost always, also gives rise to a less fortunate situation, and that is psychic phenomena. The mystic is more inclined than anyone else to believe in the psychic factors of life. And because these are inconstant, and because most of them arise within the imagination of individuals, the psychism leads to difficulties, even while mysticism leads to spiritual attainment. They are not the same thing. The pyramid, as it stands today, is, of course, the, the largest and most important of several groups of such similar buildings scattered around through Egypt and other parts of North Africa. For all intent and purposes, we are told that at the year 820 A.D., the Caliph al-Mamun of Baghdad brought a large number of workmen to Egypt to explore the Great Pyramid. The reason he did this was because there was a legend to the effect that the pyramid had been built by mysterious uh, giants called the Shedai, and that they had buried within the pyramid a great treasure and had guarded it with demons and monsters and all kinds of supernatural forces. <laughs> 
uh, Al Mamun wanted to study this for himself, and he also was very anxious to get hold of that treasure, which was presumably somewhere within the pyramid. In order to gain his end, this son of the faithful brought with him workmen from Baghdad. These workmen were good Muslims and were also uh, honest and faithful servants of the caliph. But likewise, they had been induced to hope that were the treasure found, they would benefit also. In fact, they had been assured that such would be the case. And one day, oh, in the early ninth century, the Caliph Val Mamun stood at the face and uh, base of the Great Pyramid. It was one shining surface. All of the capping stones were in place. There was no mark or opening anywhere on any of the four sides. It was so perfectly covered that it reflected the sun like a mirror on all of the sides of the southeast and west, glistened and gleamed with the light of the sun, and only the north side was silent and dark. Mamun was completely overwhelmed by this structure, over 400 feet in height. A shining pyramid-shaped body rising from a square base with four equilateral triangular sides. He just stood and looked at it. But the important thing for us, I think, to remember is that at that time all of the surfacing stones were in, pr in place. The pyramid did not consist of a series of steps of blocks. Everything was smooth. Each level had been cased and surfaced with properly cut stones, so perfectly true that it was not possible to insert a knife blade in the space between them. It is also believed that much of this work was done without any cement because the fittings of the stones were so perfect. Sometime between about the ninth century and now, all these casing stones have disappeared except six. There are six stones left that to remind us of what was originally the entire facing of the building. These stones are huge, weigh hundreds, maybe thousands of pounds, and they are still in place, but that's all there is of them. All the rest have gone. Now, we are told that they probably were used to build various structures in the city of Cairo, that they were used to uh, create palaces and mosques for the Muslims, and that little by little the Great Pyramid was turned into a quarry to be the source of base materials for building purposes. This answers one question, however, that we have to consider. There are some marks on the sides of the pyramid, considerable distance from the ground, which have been believed to mark water erosion, and the idea that the pyramid was at some time or other submerged, up at least two-thirds of the way. If Mamun's uh, statements can be believed, this is not possible. Also, it is more likely that this, these markings, these uh, marks that look like water erosions are actually sand erosions that were the result of sand blowing against the walls after the capping stones and facing stones had been removed. So the probabilities of the so-called antediluvian date remains speculative. We do not know. One thing is probably inevitable, that whoever built the pyramid had a very great knowledge, and presumably was wiser than most of the peoples in the world today. We know, uh, I was when I was in Egypt, I talked to a, a French architect who was standing alongside me at the foot of the Great Pyramid, and he said, if this building had not survived, if the modern world had had nothing to in the form of knowledge except reports about it, and the building had not been, uh, not continued to exist. 
There isn't a soul on earth who would believe that it had ever been built. And this is more or less the situation. The only reason we have to accept it is because it's there. And the more we study it, the less we know about it. Now, the uh, modern researchers have found in the uh, pressure uh, spaces above the king's chamber some markings which are assumed to be part of the of the inscription of the burial Cheops, that the this cartouche of Cheops. But when you see the cartouche photographed, it's hard to get to look at the actual one. The condition is so dim and so faint that there may be very grave doubt as to whether Cheops had anything to do with it at all. In the first place, a proud ferio wishing to mark a building as a proof of his own skills would not have placed those inscriptions in a position where they could never be read, never could be seen, and in the process of completing the building were most of them mutilated or completely obliterated. Therefore, it is not at all likely that the proud ferio uh, put something in those chambers that could not be found for centuries, for thousands of years, and then only by accident. Most of the Egyptian monuments are clearly marked with the cartouches of their originators. Some of them also have taken off an earlier cartouche and put their own in its place, the cartouche being an oval lozenger containing the name of the perio. So the Cheops theory is pretty weak, although it is still clung to for lack of a better one. And I think the real thing we have to go into in studying this is to find out, if we can, what the actual meaning of the building is. Why it was put where it is. Why other buildings and the Sphinx are in the same and person, uh, particular relationship to each other. Some of the more thoughtful progressives have come to the possible conclusion that the Great Pyramid was part of a great calendar system, that by means of it, it was possible to calculate most of the important phenomena of astronomy. The uh, ancients did not have t uh, telescopes as we know them, but they did have uh, ways of calculating mathematically uh, the various positions of planets and the precession of the equinoxes. And it's been suggested that the Great Pyramid and its immediate surrounding structures was a, tr a tremendous calendar structure, perhaps the oldest known to man. This is not unreasonable if we think about it. We know that one of the pyramids in, in Yucatan, in Chichen Itza, was an observatory the parts of which still remain and record no, we know that it was an observatory. There are also other indications. The great Zugarats of Babylonia and Chaldea were towers for stargazing. They were where the ancient Chaldeans studied the heavens year after year, century after century. And according to Budge of the British Museum, many of these uh, studies and calculations were carried on for 10 or 20,000 years. One thing that comes to mind then in connection with this whole situation is that we may have to revise our understanding of what antiquity was like. Perhaps we are, cannot assume that we have gradually arisen from a completely barbarian state and that in a few thousand years behind our present culture there was nothing but a colossal ignorance. This concept will not hold. Somewhere along the way, there were tremendous minds, a great body of knowledge that was capable of planning and executing unbelievable works of skill, beauty, and wisdom. The uh, Egyptians themselves were of the opinion that at a remote time, the gods had been with men, that deities and divine powers walked the earth. Now, uh, this again may be regarded as symbolical. Perhaps what they were trying to tell us 
is that in a remote time long ago, the human being was naturally mystical, naturally had the power of extrasensory perception, naturally could communicate or understand, estimate, or react to the divine principles upon which the universe was based. That the, really, that the gods walking with men merely meant that the god power in man was not obscured as it is now. That gradually, over a course of time, uh, the material world has taken over. The ancient peoples had a very simple physical existence, comparatively. There was no problem of population, no intensive competition in trade, and wars were comparatively uh, limited to a few swashbuckling militarists. The people in general lived a very quiet and a natural life, completely dependent upon their insights into universal laws. Just as the American Indian, without any assistance from the outside, not only developed a profound mysticism, but evolved from within himself practically every law, rule, and principle necessary to the government of his affairs. The uh, Great League of the Iroquois was probably one of the most important move movements of international peace that the world ever knew, and yet it was developed and perfected by Indians sitting under trees, wrapped in skins of animals and with feathers in their hair. And yet these people, intuitively and internally, had a tremendous depth of insight. This depth of insight has been lost as the result of the individual being subjected to continual external conditioning. He is taught from childhood not to think for himself, not to search within himself for the answers to his problems, but to read them out of books and have them conferred upon him by physical educational processes. As a result of that, he has lost the power of direct contact with realities. His new philosophy, if you could call it such, is built entirely upon the opinions of his contemporaries and the t interpretations by these contemporaries of earlier documents and beliefs. If we assume that the individual was a source of almost complete knowledge that he had the skills and the abilities to intuit nearly everything necessary to his own survival. It is then quite probable that we are gradually going to learn that the leaders of this intuitive procedure were parts of a great sacerdotal group. You might be willing to call them the mysterious sages, uh, the, wor the wise men of ancient times. The, uh, great, the first ones of the earth who knew, and the giants of mind and thought who were upon the earth in those days. In any event, however, there was undoubtedly a tradition that descended into Egypt from a still earlier source, a tradition based upon an internal development of spiritual resources, a development which went back perhaps to India, or to one of the ancient civilizations that have now vanished away. But it, by four or five thousand or even ten thousand BC, uh, there was a great knowledge in the hands or in the keeping of a few persons. And these few persons more or less set up the system of mysteries which operated in Egypt, Greece, and the Roman Empire. Now, in this also, I think it is very important. Uh, to bear in mind that the initiate system, which was the prevailing system in Egypt at that time, uh, was based upon one tremendous point, a point which we have lost, a point which we have never really attempted to restore, but about which we have given considerable thought and consideration. The purposes of the mysteries, according to such initiates as Plotinus, Crocus, Iamblichus, Ammonius, Saccus, and others, was it's very simple, that the individual should learn factually, truly, beyond question, beyond doubt, through personal experience, that death is an illusion. 
that uh, immortality is the summit of man's problem, that the ancients not only believed in it, but kept this belief in secret, but developed a science by means of which they could communicate the fact and example and circumstance of death directly to another person. In other words, the initiates of the mysteries, according to the old concepts, were persons who had lived, died, and been born again in this world. In order to accomplish this, there was an elaborate ritual system, because upon the concept of immortality was built the entire problem of an enduring material culture in this world. If immortality was demonstrable, beyond question, not the result of communication, not because certain famous person had believed it, not because we wanted to believe it, or because it was written in sacred books, or anything of that nature, but because the individual who believed it had died, passed through the experience, and come back to life. This was the burden of the mystery system was to prove conclusively that death was not the end of anything. Cicero marks this in his discussion uh, of his relationships with life. Marcus Aurelius refers to it, but it re he refers to it, as they all did, as something known, not something believed, something that could not be de denied because it had been an actual experience in the life of the believer. Thus, in the mystery system, uh, in the Egyptian, which we are interested in in the moment particularly, the Book of the Dead, which is a misnomer, part of the same type of misnomer that afflicts us in many other ways, the Book of the Dead, so-called, the Egyptian name for which was not the Book of the Dead, but the Book of the Coming Forth by Day and of the Opening of the Mouth. This was the famous name in ancient times for such great papyri as are in the museum of the British Museum uh, of the Papyrus of Ani and the Papyrus of Henutha. These were great examples of the dead coming back to life through the mysteries. Ever for the ancient philosophy of life was built upon an eternality of life. It was built upon the fact that the individual was for everlastingness, that he would go on. There was no end to him. There was no one converting people to this. There was no one preaching it or teaching it. In the mysteries, the candidate went through it himself as an actual fact. And as Apuleius tells us in the Metamorphosis, the initiate in the temple tread upon the threshold of Persephone, that is the underworld, and beheld the spirits. He went into the realm of death and returned again. Eugene O'Neill's play, Lazarus Laughed, uh, is built upon this theme and is derived very largely from the ancient teachings. In the, in the play, Lazarus, as had been raised from the dead by Christ, uh, lived on for a time, and was finally persecuted in Rome by the Emperor Caligula. And finally Caligula threatened uh, Lazarus with death, and Lazarus laughed at him. The man who had died laughed at the man who thought he could kill anything. And this was the burden of the, the mystery, that the individual who knew not because he could believe or have faith, but because through the right ceremonies and esoteric practices of the temple, he lived through it and came through alive and came out of darkness into light, knew as a certainty beyond question that there was no death. Now, we don't realize perhaps how important this point would be in the modeling of civilization. We do not realize how 
uh, oppressive the concept of death is and how the punishments of the dead in the theological systems, how they may torture or terrify the person. The main point was to establish the reality of survival and its uh, associate belief, the consciousness or concept of rebirth. Rebirth was simply immortality, spaced out. It was a part of the everlasting, ever-livingness of everything that exists. The ancients, therefore, had very little fear of death, and something of the form of a mystical experience of this probably influenced the Christian martyrs in the Cir Circus Maximus in Rome when they died for their faith. There was something about it all that transformed a life of fear into a life of, certain, of certainty. It also removed the dynamic importance of material existence and rep represented it in this world as merely the antechamber to eternity itself. Now, Hermes and several of the others and the people of the Alexandrian period like to consider the Great Pyramid as the tomb of Hermes. It is so referred to by the Neoplatonic Alexandrian mystics, who had a quite a good insight into this particular problem. It was not a tomb for a dead burial. It was a symbol of the gateway uh, to the other world and the way to return to it again. This uh, initiation rite uh, was undoubtedly sustained by the use of esoteric skills and powers that we know very little about at the present time. But it was believed that it was the tomb of wisdom, the house of the hidden places, the mysterious structure, which in a sense was a monument to eternity, standing upon the earth, pointing upward with a continuing point so that everything below verged toward the top and it was like a finger reaching up into immortality. The word pyramid itself is derived from pier meaning fire. Therefore the building was flame shaped and in the times when the stones were all in place it glistened like a glowing flame with its uh, mysterious point upward. Also, it was a marker. In the Bible, it is probably the monument that was set up in Egypt, according to the Old Testament. In any event, the Neoplatonists and those of that period thought of it, likened it to a house of the second birth, the house where the individual who was born first into this world learned the mystery of it. And... Uh, was I believe it was Porphyry, it may have been Plotinus, who said on one occasion that in human life, birth physically was the uh, uh, human being coming out of the womb into a body, and that this body itself became the womb of the second birth for the individual retaining enlightenment transcended the limitation of body, and those who did not achieve this were born out of body into an unembodied state at the end of life, so that this pattern was regarded as part of the mystery ritual. Another interesting example of this particular type of thought is to be found in Judo in Japan. Uh, judo and many other of the self-defensive uh, arts of the Orient are concerned with a peculiar kind of courage, a courage which must be completely free from anxiety and fear. If the fear exists, the individual is weakened by the rise of a terror within himself and therefore usually comes to disaster in his own day and in his own way.
So in judo, before the uh, artist achieves the highest grades of the art, he must be killed. His teacher kills him. His teacher performs certain structural pressures upon the body that stop the heart. And the heart is allowed to be stopped for a certain number of seconds, or early one or two minutes. Then the master resuscitates the disciple by pressure upon other parts of the body, according to the higher grades of judo. And in this case, the person who has been killed lives again, remembers and knows what happened to him, and realizes that his fear of death was ungrounded, that the fear of transition, which might make him a coward in this world, was a, a, simply an illusion of his own mind, that actually transition was just as normal, natural, and reasonable as any other aspect of life, and that there was no interruption. The individual never ceased to be an immortal being, whether in body or out of it. Now, the Egyptians apparently built on this very, very strongly. So did the Hindus. They fe felt or realized the tremendous significance of this realization that there was no termination, that there was no end, that the labors of a life were never lost, and that the achievements of a life were forever necessary, that the individual who had an idea that his virtues might go to oblivion with him was wrong, and the one who believed that his vices would go to oblivion with him, he also is wrong. There is an interruption of place, but not of state. There is an interruption in the sequence of relationships between the individual and the material body, but no interruption in the continuity of the life within that body. Thus, materialism, which has become more or less prevalent in our time, can be held responsible for a very large amount of the unfortunate pressure that bothers us today. Materialism sustains crime, uh, helps to build a constant fear, makes the individual highly materialistic because he knows no other outlet, uh, helps to build a constant fear, makes the individual highly materialistic because he knows no other outlet, and little by little the world comes to be afraid of life afraid of the existence of which, uh, in which it, it passes its days here in the world. Asclepius and Hermes in the dialogue pointed out that the time would come when Egypt, which of course was a symbol of the whole world, uh, would forget its gods, that it would deteriorate, that it would depart from heaven, that it would build false images, false goals, and false purposes to justify its own errors, that it would uh, go into a state of conflict with all other things, that it would waste the values of the earth. He points out definitely that the earth would be impoverished, the soil would be impoverished, that the humanity living would have no conception of its responsibilities, but would live for pleasure and profit alone. And as this happened, gradually the planet would become a desert that everything that was useful would no longer be able to function or manifest itself. But that in, in spite of this, that something inside of the human being could not die. This eternal life that was recognized in the great mystery system went on. And also in the course of time, the life within the individual would revolt against the misconduct of his mind, emotions, and body. And when the great tragedy revealed itself to be the result of human selfishness, cupidity, and ignorance, the humanity would then go back to the gods, go back to the divine principle within himself, and create a new world emerging out of his own repentance, out of his own realization of his mistake out of his own fear, perhaps, of the final destruction of himself and everything that exists. 
but nothing will be destroyed. It is all part of the illusion. It is an illusion which continues until the human being makes peace with universal law. When the human being accepts the governorship of the great values of life, he is then no longer subject to the infirmities of the flesh. Uh, if you look at the various sacred buildings of the world, you will notice that nearly all of them are symbols of aspiration and ascent. And for this, we have to go back to the very primitive form of astronomy. The ancient astronomy divided existence into three levels, the lowest being the planes of elements, uh, the second level being the planes of planets, and the third and higher level, the plane of the zodiac or the fixed stars. The universe had three great steps ascending, and the life of man consisted first of a descent, as in the story of the death of Tammuz in Babylonia, and finally out of the grave of materiality, a resurrection, a regeneration, and ascent up a ladder, Jacob's ladder, or the ladder of Muhammad, to ascend as in the vision of St. John on Patmos to the heavenly world that lay above the zodiac. This concept was a sort of skeleton upon which all of the philosophies of ancient times were built. And the simplest way of representing this situation was by the mound, or the pyramid, which incidentally could be a tomb, because it would then become a witness to the fact that the being in the tomb was not really dead. The tomb became then a symbol of belief in the resurrection. It was a monument to prove that it was over the body only, and that the soul, mind, and spirit had ascended into a better world. This ascent was represented in India by the use of a cube and a pyramid. The pyramid was uh, placed on the cube to represent the union of the material quaternary and the spiritual triad. It was an ascending problem. All through the present Buddhist world, graves are in the form of little stupas or pagodas with five levels to represent the ascent of life, and the headstone became a ladder to lead to the higher worlds and to bear witness to the fact that the person buried there knew his own immortality and would go on to freedom and liberation. The enlightened person was always represented by a grave marker, which was the symbol of immortality and not the symbol of death. In the Cambodia and in many buildings, this particular concept was created by means of a cube and a sphere. And spheres were also placed in the Great Pyramid and have been found there small articles to represent levels or planes, to level truly the levels of stones. A small sphere was placed upon them. If it did not roll off, the stones were true. This sphere became a dome rising from a quaternary, and this dome itself became the symbol, uh, as far as we are concerned, of the invisible causal nature which surmounts and overwhelms and dominates the material body. Therefore, a building with a dome is a symbol of the recognition of the power of the divine over the natural life of the individual. The, squat, the body below was a cube, square, or a building of cubical structure. The dome was the symbol of the overshadowing of divinity. The overshadowing, the recognition, that heaven moves like a great dome forever over the surface of the earth. The earth was the cube, the dome was the heaven moving above it. And the uh, dome gradually became the minaret, it became the steeple of the church, it became the dome of the uh, Capitol building in Washington, the dome of the Vatican, and mysterious domes on the Muslim mosques, and the mysterious pyramid forms that we find in some Protestant churches, as in the case of the Westminster Abbey, which has the pyramid over the central entrance. All of these together represent the survival of a language 
that had to do with, with the human realization of his own nature. The pyramid stood upon the earth. It represented a flame ascending. It was a radiant structure that had been built in ancient times, but it was always pointing upward. It was always impelling the individual to follow an ascending line and look up to the stars. At various seasons of the year, by looking up, the beholder gazed upon the constellations, the figures, and the mysterious language written upon the wall of heaven. Uh, Gatharo, who was the secretary of Cardinal Richelieu, wrote a book in which he showed that the star groups that were in the form of consonant letters of the Chaldaic alphabet that later became the ancient Hebrew. These constellational patterns were consonants. The planets moving through them were vowels. And by studying this proposition, the handwriting on the wall of heaven could be read. It's an interesting theory and has been given some attention, but not too much in recent times. But we have the great dome of heaven moving upon the earth. We also have the pyramid as the house of a mysterious elevation, the four square of the base uh, from which rises the, the, the pyramidal form, consisting of four triangles, each with three sides, which make twelve lines or twelve angles, which represent the zodiac. The building was oriented to the eleventh decimal point, and was uh, probably perfect at one time, but there is damage to one wall of it as a result of an earthquake. I, uh, I never was quite strong enough and physical enough to climb the outside of the pyramid. Very few people are. It is really an arduous job. You have to have about four dagger men or natives to help you. Two would go in front, scrambled up one of the blocks, which is about four feet, and pull. The other two are behind and push, and you are gradually elevated level by level over the hundreds of levels that lead to the top. This is a little too much for the average person, especially in the desert where the temperature is apt to be well over 100. But I did go through all of the interior rooms, the king's chamber and the queen's chamber, and as far as we could get in the uh, grand passageways leading downward. Uh, one thing was very evident and has been discovered, and that is that the inside of the pyramid, the temperature, is the mean temperature of the earth. For the average person, it is colder than Christmas. It is a constant chill, and it is a dead chill. There is no modifying circumstance. And many persons who come out of the pyramid into the heat of the sun uh, have very serious colds and occasionally pneumonia. But this peculiar deadness inside was probably put there or achieved for a purpose. It was probably in this deadness that the, the transcendent or suspension of life in the ceremony of the coming forth by day was performed. The individual was in the tomb. He was attended by the priests. He was dead. And like the prodigal son, whose father said, my son was dead, but he is alive again. Humanity was the prodigal son. There were two ways of growing in this world. One was to grow slowly by cause and effect and by the labors of living. The world itself became a great temple in which initiation took place over a period of hundreds of lives. But to the ancients, there was a wise man's way. And this wise man's way was to pass through by conscious intent and by purification the mystery of the whole cycle in one embodiment. Now, one might say this would be the simple way. And I know a lot of metaphysicians at the present time who can hardly wait for that one embodiment that's going to do it all. <laughs> but most of them have forgotten something. Namely, that this one embodiment means that everything accomplished in hundreds of lives must be accomplished in that one embodiment. It's not just a shortcut. It is a gathering up and intensifying the process of human regeneration. 
It means that the person must attain to a state by discipline, by dedication, and in accordance with universal law that qualifies him uh, to receive this very important uh, ritual. And after he has received the ritual, after he has had the experience, he is not released from responsibility, but brought into the presence of a greater responsibility. Having become, as Apuleius points out, a citizen of two worlds, the individual must act accordingly. He also learns from certain experiences along the way what he can't do and what he can do. He learns, for example, that if he is interested in primar primarily in his own security, he has already failed. It is not a case of where he is doing this to become nobler, more enlightened, more successful than other people. He is doing it for one purpose only, that he can be a better service, a servant of the infinite. The ritual produces dedicated disciples of wisdom not satisfied people who sit back and try to nurse their own intelligence. It is a case in which every step carries with it a heavy burden of duty, and that uh, the final achievement requires the complete abnegation of personal self-interest, a complete overcoming of the problems of egoism and egotism. Otherwise, all is lost. Furthermore, there can be no backsliding, because the individual must reach a state of certainty before this enlightenment is given that makes it utterly and completely impossible to backslide. He cannot get it and then fail and turn from it. If he turns from it, it means he never had it. If he fails, he fails himself. He cannot fail the infinite so that the, uh, the rituals of the initiations of those times were very, very severe. There is an account that Thomas Taylor is said to have found in the records of the British Museum, although uh, no proof is available of it. It is interesting, at least. Namely, that Plato was initiated in the Great Pyramid, and it was there that he received his own final enlightenment. But this presents another problem. If he was uh, initiated in the Great Pyramid uh, in the 4th century B.C., how did he get in? All those capstones were in place. Everything was closed. The answer would appear to be that there must be other entrances. There must be some other way of getting into the building. When Mamun, the uh, caliph of Baghdad, was uh, fuddling with the pyramid, trying to get into it, it occurred to him that his native followers would probably be pretty unhappy and might very well turn against him when they found there were no treasures in there to reward them for their effort, because when they got in there, the building was empty. There was no mummy, there was no body of a previous burial, although the walls had not been disturbed. And that makes it seem very unlikely that it was a tomb, primarily. But one of his natives, one of Mamun's natives, uh, while fussing around in the excavation, suddenly disappeared, and later appeared out in the desert, half mad. This seems to suggest that there was some way in or out of the of the building. Uh, the wall upon of or cliff upon which the pyramid was built has been carefully studied. There is no openings that have been found. The Sphinx has been pierced with rods throughout its entire body, but no openings have been found within it. And it, of course, was, the Sphinx was a living outcropping of rock. It was not built. It, the only thing that was built were the front paws. In other words, the, if it was true, did the uh, initiation ceremony take place when the person was voluntarily out of the physical body? The ancient priests were able to function out of the body. This there can be no reasonable doubt. And it is also mentioned in a number of early Christian reports. Namely, that it was perfect, per that it was possible for the in invisible bodies of the individual uh, to uh, be separated from the visible. 
without a loss of consciousness or a loss of intelligence, and that the invisible body could travel to distant places and could have various experiences. And many people believe this is a comparatively common happening in sleep, that the individual is not actually asleep spiritually, only physically, and that the superphysical vehicles are just as busy while he's asleep as when he is awake. But regardless of this particular point, it is possible that the initiations of the pyramid were given while the candidate was out of the physical body. If so, then there would be no problem of the difficulty of getting into the building. The superphysical vehicles could go through very easily. Another problem that arises in connection with the pyramid project is uh, something that is coming along now, namely that the pyramid was some kind of a vibratory structure, uh, radiating energy, and having some strange virtue in itself, and that meditation upon the pyramidal shape produces certain changes in the human consciousness. The particular shape, angle, and tip of the pyramid, its proportions and so forth, having very definite significance. Now, this point is not original now. It is referred to in very ancient times, for it was believed and taught that in Egypt, it is earlier or earlier than Pythagoras of Samos, that is the 6th century B.C., the Egyptians represented their deities by symmetrical geometric solids and that in the temples, the five perfect solids were used to represent the principal deities, that each of them, with a different shape, a different proportion, and a different arrangement, represented one of the deities, and that, most important of all, the contemplation of these forms had meaning, that the, the contemplation of the symmetric solids could heal disease, could expand consciousness, could relieve the mind of distress, and could calm the emotions. Each of these forms, then, was, in a sense, therapeutic, because perfect harmony is always therapeutic. If music as harmony can improve health, uh, then we may say that the harmonic solids are a form of music captured in material like metal, uh, stone or crystals, and have the same effect as music, color, or any other therapeutic factor. Form and shape exercise a spiritual authority over the individual. Now, this was known to the Chinese, or at least believed by them, and we find traces of this in the I Ching. Most of all, however, we find in the Orient the painting and uh, scenery, beautiful uh, symbolic designs, mandalas, were particularly uh, important in releasing the individual from the negative moods of life, that he was able to contemplate more fully and by relaxing could take harmony into himself. One of the problems we face today is the constant pressure of inharmony. We live in a world in which very little is the way we wish it was. We are all constantly under the pressure of worry, anxiety, fear, despondency, irritation, aggravation. These things press in upon us all the time. We are also afflicted by the very appearance of our civilization. There is nothing more depressing than the average city. And there are very few things much more depressing than the average house. Because people simply have not the insight or the understanding uh, to build structures suitable to the release of their own consciousness. The individual concerned only with physical comfort may live in an environment which makes his spiritual nature completely uncomfortable. Also, public buildings now no longer have their foundation in the Dionysian artificers of old who built buildings according to the laws of the gods and the geometry of nature. Today we build them largely to look like blocks of ice because that is the cheapest way to put them together. They cost millions as it is, but they have nothing. There is no warmth, there is no real beauty, 
but finally the average individual tries to put his own concept of beauty into them and looks at one of these atrocities and says it's wonderful. <laughs> be simply because he has become accustomed to something that was not right until he finally accepts deformity as normalcy. This type of thing the ancients didn't believe in. And probably the most perfect structure that antiquity knew was the pyramid. The pyramid had several advantages. First of all, it was simple. It had no details. It had no uh, structural peculiarities that would distort or clutter up the fine mathematical proportion. It was a perfect example of geometry. It was in all its parts balanced, orderly, methodical. It was exactly what it appeared to be, and it was in all ways suitable for the sacred purpose for which it was intended. So this type of building had the simplicity of an almost archetypal reality. What most people do not realize is that ultimately the universe is very simple. It is man who contemplate, complicates it. The universe is a simple process unfolding in its own way and has always been a direct unfoldment of principles. Man, however, has confused the issue completely. He has distorted and rearranged things for his own pleasures with no consideration for their essential natures or the principles for which they were intended. Uh, recently, in, on the, uh, in, uh, on, in Java, on Indonesia, a re restoration process has been used on the Great Pyramid and at Jakarta, known now as the Borobudur. This great Buddhist monument is another one of those mysteries. It is a pyramid. It is a perfect pyramid in a sense. But it represents a different philosophy of life. Therefore, it is presented with somewhat uh, modified symbolism. <laughs> uh, up to about 25, 30 years ago, this great monument, which is probably one of the largest religious structures on earth, was, a, was gradually fading away. The rock from which it was composed was weathering out of existence. Uh, the lack of adequate foundation was undermining its stability. And suddenly the world decided something should be done about it. So UNESCO started a program for the restoration of the Borobudur. And the job has been very, very well done at expense of many millions of dollars. But this great religious monument now stands as it was originally intended to stand. It is a pyramid that rises uh, up through seven levels, much like the Zugarat of Babylon and Chaldea. The upper or apex part of the pyramid of the Burbuda was a pagoda-like stupa or a reliquary with two rooms in it, which was empty. The restoration of it has never been able to find anything in for that empty room. It, the building builds up to a symbol and then ceases. And this is the same thing that happens in the pyramid. The capstone of the pyramid is missing. The, the sacred relic that was supposed to be in the capstone or head of the Borobudur is also missing. So that all these things represent a certain unfinishedness. And it reminds us, perhaps, that in natural law and in the reactions within our own natures, everything that belongs to the material world is unfinished. Existence, mortal existence, is an unfinished business. And it takes place in an unfinished world and challenges everything that lives here with the restrictions of an unfinished realization of truth. Everything is growing, but nothing has completed its growth. Everything is getting better, but nothing in the mortal world has finally achieved the state of being best. Everything we try to do, everything we try to work with, science particularly, should have a complete understanding of the mystery of the missing capstone. Because science is worrying over it right at the moment, but in, on a different level of thought. Everything that science discovers leads somewhere. But when it just about gets to the point where it looks as though it might tell us a great truth, it fades away. <laughs>
all visible things, if you trace them upward to their highest conditions, disappear. All of the intellectual achievements of the individual or of the great system of learning. This ascends from one level of genius to another, but the supreme genius has never been reached. The supreme answer to the problem of life has never been reached. All that we have for these particular conclusions is our own inward realization. So the formula is rather simple. We can build everything on the outside up to a point, but to complete it we must call entirely upon the inside. It is our own inner life that must perfect every structure that is formed in the material world. The answer to everything lies in ourselves. We can read books up to a certain point. We can use laboratory experiments up to a certain point. But somewhere along the line, as the alchemists learned, and they studied from the Alexandrian savants, the al alchemists learned that the final ingredient of the transmutation was man himself, the internal part of his own nature. His own soul had to transform base metals into gold. His, each individual soul must perfect the structure of his life, otherwise it will never be perfected. So to account for this, nearly every monument of importance in the world either has the top part missing or a bad scar in it, something imperfect, something that represents uh, a flaw in the original purpose, because the completion of it must always depend upon the consciousness of the person beholding it. Otherwise, the secret cannot be perfected. Another interesting aspect of the pyramid problem has to do with the pattern of the Egyptian temple system. I think there's a good probability that somewhere there was some form of contact between the pyramid and one of the other temples of Egypt. This may have been, however, inten intentionally closed off at some time. This presents us with a very curious circumstance. The king's chamber in the pyramid, uh, hidden within 200 uh, feet of masonry in all directions, was originally ventilated. Two air shafts went from the king's chamber in an upright diagonal motion to the surface of the pyramid. But when the capping stones and the casing stones were put in place, those air chambers, those air passageways were sealed off. In other words, they come to the surface but are now covered or were covered originally by the casing stones. There was no aperture. They were not ventilated, but they were originally intended for ventilation. The answer seems to be, therefore, that something in there had to be alive and had to have air, although there is no clue to what it might have been. Of course, the present openings have nothing to do with the ancient uh, design of the pyramid. Why, uh, for instance, would it be called the tomb of Hermes? What and who was Hermes? Hermes was the Greek and, uh, form of the deity Mercury. And the Egyptian form of Mercury and Hermes was Thoth, the god of the writing tablet. Hermes was a symbol of the universal mind, because it was said of him in his own day, whenever that was, because he is probably also a symbol invented by the Alexandrian esotericists. He is not known prior to the rise of Alexandria. What was that he was the author of 10,000 books, and some of the old stories tell us that he was the author of every book that was ever written in the world. Well, the implication is pretty obvious, namely that he has to represent the power of mind, which is the author of all things. Therefore, Hermes is universal mind. He is the uh, universal mind that may have been symbolically buried in the Great Pyramid, which is supposed to have been his tomb. Not a uh, burial, but the universal mind itself, which in turn might point out the idea 
uh, of a universal symbolism, that the secret of the mind was built into the structure of the pyramid, and therefore the investigation of the pyramid could ultimately lead to the discovery of the nature of mind. In any event, however, Hermes, as the author of all the books in the world, uh, became, in a sense at least, the symbol of the great esoteric schools. He became the scribe of the gods, the interpreter of heaven. He attended the psychostasia, or the weighing of the soul of the dead, in the great Egyptian mortuary papyri and paintings. And uh, Budge, and uh, also Breasted of Chicago, were perfectly aware that the Book of the Dead was a symbolic document, and that the symbolism of the death and resurrection of the soul in that book was based upon the rituals of the mysteries. Here we have a parallel, therefore, that we have to consider. Namely, that in the old papyri, uh, the tomb of the deceased person was nearly always portrayed as a pyramid. It was a pyramid upon a square base. And the uh, opening of the base was in the bottom, not on the pyramid top, it in the square base. Therefore, the implication could be that there was an opening in the pyramid below the level of its foundation. But in any event, this ritual was the story of the soul's journey into the afterlife. And uh, it was a very complicated story in the Egyptian mythology. But it all was condensed into a, a fraction of its original length in a ritual performed by the Egyptian priests. Uh, Breasted told me that he was perfectly aware that it was a ritual when he translated these papyri. And this ritual was the ritual of coming forth by day. Those who die the ordinary death go forth by night, according to the Egyptians, and they wander in a kind of darkness, of uncertainty, they wander through a universe that is benign, wonderful, loving, but like an infant, they have no memory or no conscious thought of where they're going. So those of that type who just simply die as they have lived, asleep as to reality, who have never improved themselves by any conscious effort, these are the little ones. They are not evil. They're not doomed for perdition, their mistakes will not prevent them from growing, but they are still unable to come forth by day, which means they cannot come forth consciously. They cannot come forth lighted by their own inner light. So they are the ones who must wait or must go to the Amentet, the Amentet or Elysian fields being the paradise of Egypt. The, uh, the soul of the Egyptian who died uh, went on into the other world and did what he did here. There is the story, of course, of the money lender who died in Egypt in the old days. He was a good man. He was honest in his money lending. He never cheated anybody. He was very sincere, but he had no knowledge of anything but money lending. So when he died, they gave him a table and some small change, and told him to keep right on going. So he kept on borrowing in Monday. As a ghost, he, he lent money to spirits that did not exist except in himself, and received interest on them, and lived very happily, enjoying the, the life he was familiar with. And this he would continue to do until he was brought back into embodiment. And then gradually, little by little, he would outgrow it. But there was no force in it. There was no evil in it. There was nothing terrible that was going to happen to him. He was going to be very happy because he was a good man. Virtue rewards with happiness in the afterlife. It may not result in illumination because the average person who passes on will not be happy with illumination. He will be happy only with the things that are familiar to him. The way of life he has always known is what will make him happy. But after the initiation rites, have been performed. The individual comes forth by day. He realizes his place in the plan, 
He realizes what is next for him. He realizes that going into this larger life is an opportunity to correct all failings of his own thinking. They will come closer and closer to the eternal truths, which are the source of his ultimate union with deity. So by coming forth by day, he comes consciously into the afterlife, fully equipped to face its mysteries, fully equipped to adjust to its circumstances, and already able, at least dimly, to perceive the face of the great God that hides behind the veil. And in Egypt, I think the Egyptians believed that the Great Pyramid was the symbol of the state of consciousness, the state of the internal life of the individual, which in perfect mathematical order and harmony comes forth out of the body, in the light, and is led by the master of the secret house into the presence of the great gods, where he receives this, the uh, Kroixan Sutta, the symbol of everlasting life. Everlasting life is not the fact that we live forever, for we do that whether we know it or not. But everlasting life is to know it, to realize it, to understand it, not to doubt or to fear. We have a life, as the Egyptians said, unto everlastingness. But only those who have retained a certain inward light know for certain that which others hope. And as the Roman, one of the Roman philosophers said, wisdom brings knowledge to those who have hoped and brings perfect understanding to those who have lived in a certain optimism, but not certain of that which is to come. But the mysteries may put the whole universe in order. They put the individual in order. They made everything as it was and as it should be. And the pyramid, according to the Egyptians, was a test testimony set up under the directions of deities and their architects and artisans, so that all men might know that forever and ever the great light, the great good, and the flame of aspiration would burn in man. And if, as long as it burns in man, it will burn in the world. But if it goes out in man, it goes out forever. So the wisdom of the ancients was to continually introduce and initiate the worthy into the real purpose of the plan, to help them to understand the great dignity of life, the great value and virtue of obedience to law, and that forever the pact between heaven and earth was sealed by the symbolism of the pyramid. This is what uh, the Alexandrians worked out and thought about it, and I think it comes rather close to the facts of the matter. Well, I guess that's all for today.